Kerwin? Uh, where, where are you going? Oh. Uh, That's weird. Uh, I didn't even say hello. There's something funny going on around here. I want to find out. up to something. I want to find out. There's that axe that he was using to murder that mower with. No, mother. Don't worry about what I'm doing out here. Something concerned. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. alcohol out here. I hope nobody's been messing around because I can get in a lot of trouble if they find out what I'm doing. Oh, what's that? What was that? I hope nobody's in here hiding. <laughs> oh crap! Come out, come out! Wherever you are! <laughs> I know you're up here, because I can smell you. Where are you hiding? Oh, were you trying to play with my train set? Oh, I think I know where. <laughs> Today's video is going to be on this here, Dill and McGuire, 1960, walk behind push mower with a brakes and scrap em engine on it. Look at this mower. This thing's pretty cool. Dill and McGuire, they made lawnmowers out of Richmond, Indiana. That's not too far from Podunk. And it's got that brakes and scrap em crank starter on it. This is another mower that came out of Uncle Pat's collection. So Uncle Pat brought this to us. He said this would be a good video to do. See if you can get it running, Terrell. He keeps throwing these challenges at me. So this is a pretty, pretty unique and I would think high-tech mower for the time because it's got an aluminum deck on it. And check out this. You can adjust all four wheels with this adjuster. So that's pretty, pretty much ahead of its time. We'll have to lube that up a little bit. But the first thing we're gonna do is try to get it running. So of course, we're gonna wanna check for spark and compression and that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna check for compression and spark at the same time. So I got this on crank, cause that's start and crank. And we have no spark and no compression. And I thought I had a flashlight. Yeah. 
And let's take a look inside the gas tank and it is a mess. It is a dirty mess. So that's going to have to be cleaned. And usually when you go to clean this old stuff, if it's rusted, when it removes all the rust, then we're going to have a gazillion pinholes in it. So we'll have to get the poor 15 out, seal it all up, and maybe even use some red coat on the inside. I like to, like to seal the inside a lot of times with the red coat and seal the outside with the poor 15. All right, well, I'm going to pull the blower shroud off, pull the flywheel off, pull the head off. Maybe it's just got a stuck valve and we can get some fresh on. All right, disconnecting the fuel line, which as you notice is an actual fuel line. It's metal, it's not a hose. And over here, I'm gonna loosen the nut for the fuel line on the carburetor so I can kind of swing it out of the way. There we go. I already removed the two screws in the back for the blower housing. Now I'll remove the one in the front. And this should come off. Yeah. Whoa, that thing's heavy. Man, is that heavy. So it looks like it might have been leaking a little bit already. But here's that crank starter. I got these tabs all covering that. So you take it apart. Good thing this thing works. And this little this little cover here looks like it's separate. That's got brakes and scrap them stamped in there. I like that. They should bring that back. That art deco vintage look where they used to stamp it right in the metal. So if you're watching breaks and scrap them, you should bring that look back, that retro look. Maybe that'll help helping the sales of the crappy products you're turning out now. I used to be a big fan of Briggs. Not anymore. So you could see that this thing was painted after this cover was on. And look at that, 1960. So this thing is what, 63 years old at the time of the shooting of this video? And look at that metal, it's still clean metal. It's not, it's not all rusty. Too bad, this, too bad this gas tank didn't come off of here. Well, I'm going to fill it with white vinegar, and it's going to have to set. I know I could use um, muriatic acid and speed up the process. I don't like using that stuff. I don't like the way it smells. I don't like breathing it. Even when I do it outside, you still get a whiff of that stuff. I, I don't like that muriatic acid. I mean, it, it's quick, and it, it'll clean it fast, but... It's highly toxic. All right. Ho hopefully this coil is good. This is loose on there. It's got a big split in it. Here's the starter clutch. We'll have to lubricate that. I'm hoping we can just get away with, with points condenser. Let me get this fuel line out of the way. We'll get rid of this galvanized water pipe exhaust. I'll put a regular cigar type muffkin on there. And then let's go ahead. I'm going to pull all these head bolts and get that head pulled off and let's see what's going on with the valves. All right, I pulled the head off and the valves open. Let's see if it's going up and down. Nope, so we got stuck valves. Yeah, 
And while we're at it, let's take a peek inside here and see if we have any dinosaur syrup. And looks like it's pretty low. So this thing's probably using oil. Well, we're just going to concentrate on getting it running. So I'm going to spray some croil in there. And get me a hammer. And I'm going to spin it over so the intake valve's open. That way I know there's no tension on the exhaust valve. And we'll do that a few times. Now I'm going to get me a pair of pliers. I like these because they're kind of curved for grabbing round stuff. And maybe by turning it. That'll help free it up. Next, I'm going to try some carb spray. Sometimes works good for dissolving any of that stuff. The only problem is now I got to find a pan. A lot of times I'll have all these cans on my bench and then somebody comes over and grabs it. That's why, what happened to my carb spray? I may have to pull the valve out. Sometimes you get lucky and it'll free up without, without having to do much. But in this case, let me try spinning it some more. Nope. some more in there. All right, I'm just gonna pull it out. And we'll do a we'll do a proper valve job, and then that way we can take a look a look see inside the carburetor, and I can get this piece of pipe out of there. So next, I'm gonna pull the flywheel and the starter clutch. Gonna zip the starter clutch off with my starter clutch tool. 19244 in case you're interested in one of them. And it's just regular right hand threads to remove it. And this is kind of sticky here. So if you're doing these, you need to clean this shaft real good because that, that's what will make like a grunting or a grinding noise because this will get dirty and sticky. Flywheel key doesn't appear to be sheared. Now I gotta get my flywheel knockoff tool. So here's a flywheel, a Briggs flywheel knockoff tool. It's got a little piece of brass down the center. Keep it soft. And then right off of here is a little, little 
little nub sticking up that you can pry off of. Since I'm left-handed, I'm going to have to cross my hands. So put some, oh, pressure on it. You're supposed to put pressure on it, whack the end of that, but it looks like I didn't have to do all that. It popped off just by frying it. So there's a flywheel, light flywheel, pretty light. And we reach over here, past you, get that key out of there. It's an aluminum key. <clears throat> and the reason they make it aluminum is so when you hit something, it'll shear so you don't bust the flywheel. If this coil is bad, I may have to do like I've done on some other engines, and that is convert it to electronic ignition. But on this old ignition here with the points, it's not going to be as simple as just putting an upgraded electronic ignition coil on there because this has got three legs on the coil. So I would also have to change the flywheel and I would have to find a newer upgraded flywheel because this has got separated magnets and in order for it to work with the electronic ignition I'd need a newer flywheel that has one complete magnet on there. So I'd have to find like a three horse flywheel. Now this has got a bunch of, it looks like Black Beauty sandblasting sand all underneath here. So I'm going to take some shop air, kind of blow that lightly. Blow that sand off of there. And take our points cover off. You've probably seen me do this in many videos. Because we've been doing a lot of old stuff lately. Where I've been replacing the points. And look at them points. Look at all that crust on there. Look at that. That'll make it not spark. So I got new points condenser, so we're not going to sand them. Because we know how much you fans, you ain't supposed to sand the points. It leaves behind some particles. It makes the points wear out faster. Let's make sure our plunger isn't stuck. And it's pretty sticky. I think recently I got some sets of points. I think they were Na some old Napa brand points somebody had given me. It actually came with the new plunger and everything in it. I got to be careful when I'm pulling that out because I did it on that Sano duck mower where I tried to pull out that stuck uh, points plunger and I ended up breaking it. Then I had to drill it out. Then I had to put that sleeve in there. I think if I keep spraying some carb spray on there, maybe I can get it out without wrecking it. So let me work on that, getting that out. Getting a new set of points and we'll check. Make sure we got spark. Spin it too. Maybe spinning it around will help. Keep spraying some carb spray on there.
these side cutters and just slowly. There we go. Woo! Got it out. Oh wow. I can feel like a little little ridge on the end of it there. So who knows, this thing may be wore down. This thing may smoke like a freight train too. Rings might all be wore out. All right. Well, let me go get the points. Watch yourself, Mr. Cameraman. I'll put a rag over this. Let me go get the points. While we're at it, clean this up. And uh, fingers crossed, this coil is still good. So it was Niehoff, not Napa. There was a set of Napa for the old cast iron. I remember seeing these old Niehoff parts in our garage when I was a kid. They were in Chicago. Points and condenser kit. So yeah. Just like today, you can go to some auto parts stores and get aftermarket lawnmower parts. So here we got the points. There's a condenser, there's the points, the spring, a new key, a plunger and a little tool, a little release tool. So yeah, that's that's kind of a better kit from the auto parts store back in the day and that moves in and out real good here's that little tool so we could release the wire now there is a protective coating that they would put on the points so they wouldn't corrode in the box. So I just sprayed a little carb spray on there to remove that coating. This one seems to have gotten a little a little rusty from sitting on the shelf. I got a Scotch Brite, so that that might work. That way we're not using sandpaper. Still feels like there's something on there. I got a file. Let me get my little file. Cause this has got to make good contact otherwise it ain't going to spark yeah you can see it's removing whatever was on there yeah got that pretty clean All right, let's install it and see if we got spark. So now I got the points reinstalled, the new ones. Now we gotta set them at 20 thousandths and they gotta be set when the points are at their widest point. So that's open. Well, stop turning on me. Oh, because of that stuck valve. Let me go back. There it's closed, there it's open. You can see where they're opening and closing. So the widest point right there. Loosen this clamp. Push the condenser up. Tighten that down. And we got good 20 thousandths. 
Then you're supposed to clean them with a piece of paper. So to make sure that you didn't have anything on the feeler gauge. I get them to close. So it puts tension on the paper. And you don't want to pull the paper out and accidentally have it tear a piece off because then you won't have any the points won't close, that paper will be in there, it won't make contact, you won't have any spark. So I'm just cleaning it that way and I'll lift it out. Then I always like to give them a little snap. Make sure they're getting a good contact. Alright. So Let's put the points cover back on. Clean it out if it's dirty in there. Which this one's a little bit dirty. Put the points cover back on. And then we will uh, put the flywheel on. And see if we got any spark. So let me go over this starter clutch a little bit and how this thing works. It's got little balls in there. There's little balls. And I've had people, because these things would squeal and they don't know how it works, they would take it apart and they would put grease in here. You don't put any lubricant in here at all. It's got to be dry because the lubricant will make the ball stick. The, the ball's got to float around in there. Now the balls on this one were sticking. So I just went through these little holes on this old one here, because the new, the new starter clutches don't have these holes in it. So I went around and I sprayed some brake cleaner in there and then I blew it out with some shop air. So you do not grease this. If anything, you're gonna, oil, you're gonna put some oil on the shaft that goes through here. But you don't want any grease or oil or any kind of lubricant in there. It's got to be dry. Those balls got to move free so they catch. All right, so let's get the spark tester hooked up again. Whatever I did with it. Oh, it's on the floor over there. Grab it, Mr. Cameraman. If anyone can, cameraman can. We need to find a good grounding spot. I may have to solder this. I don't like how this, look at this whole coil and everything is flopping around on here. I may have to solder that. I don't like that that's making a loose connection. A lot of times if you rock it back and forth, it should snap. No? All right, let's try to spin it faster. So I'm gonna spin it with the starter clutch, but I'm not gonna use an impact because an impact will break it. I'm gonna spin it with my cordless drill, which I got an adapter for half inch socket. So let's see if it'll spark. Oh yeah. Well, it would also help if I didn't leave one of these mats under there. <laughs> But it sparks. Woohoo! All right. So I'm going to solder that wire on there. And then I'm going to flip this thing around. We're going to pull the carburetor off and pull the valves out. And then we'll take a little peek inside the carburetor. All right, I got it soldered on there good. And I just got me a new soldering gun. And I didn't know which one to get. So I asked my brother Farrell, and he said to get this one, this Weller. And it wasn't too much money either. Because it's got two heat ranges. You pull it in first click, and it's a lower heat range, and then you pull it all the way in and it's higher. 
So now I got me a good soldering gun that uh, I can solder these heavy wires and I'm not sitting there forever. All right, so now that I soldered that, I want to check the spark again to make sure I didn't, didn't damage the coil by pouring that heat to it. And this time, make sure there's nothing underneath here before I go spinning that thing again. Where's that grill? All right. All right, now we're on the carburetor side. It's got that oil bath air filter. And you could tell it was well maintained. Looks like they put grease instead of oil in there. So that'll have to be cleaned up. And here's our kill wire, kill switch it looks like which I forgot when we were under that flywheel there was no wire going to this plus this isn't touching anyway so this is I'm gonna have to take this off and I'm gonna have to run a wire to the points and then bend this back so it's here so that way when you idle it down it touches this tab and it will kill the engine so we need to hook up a kill wire to it this is our kill switch and it also our cable clamp. So that's 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 not too bad to fix. That'll be that's an easy fix. Yeah, take this all the way off. Stick it in my little tray where I don't lose it. I don't know why I'm saving that old points plunger. Throw that in the garbage. Where are those little points? Throw all that stuff in the garbage. And then we'll disconnect our cable. I'm going to have to oil this cable if I can get it out. Let's see if this throttle even works. I don't want to break it. No. It's all froze up. I'm pulling on the cable and pushing down. All right. So we need to lubricate this. So here's our throttle mechanism. There's a spring in there. That's probably our governor spring, which is gonna put tension on this air vein. All right, so here our throttle shaft is froze. That's stuck. And then we got our little link here that joins all that. So again, with the carb spray, spray a little on here. Spray some down the throat. And there's a choke too. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a choke down in here. Here's our choke. And that also appears to be froze. All right, so I'm gonna try to remove the carburetor without trying to unstick that choke in that throttle shaft right now. I don't want to break it. Again, 60 some years old, 63 year old lawnmower. These parts aren't like I can just go upstairs and pick them off the shelf. We'll look in the carburetor and I can throw this in the ultrasonic cleaner. Disconnect our link. There's our little breather tube. We don't want to lose this link. This is called the Lancelot link. The secret chimp. Yeah, that's that's stuck. All right. Wrench. Back up, cameraman. Pack it up, pack it up, pack it up, Mr. Cameraman. Back it up, back it up, pack it up. And let's see what awaits us in the float bowl. 
Oh, there's some kind of liquid coming out. And it's a little foamy. Take the handle of a screwdriver here. And look at the carnage. Look at. Mmm, that's some fresh fuel there. Don't you just love the smell of that? I hate the smell of that. And when you get this stuff on your fingers, you still smell it for a day or so, no matter how much you try to clean. All right, so I'm not going to try to handle this too much. This is going right in the ultrasonic cleaner. And hopefully, I'm not going to turn that thing on yet because it messes with the camera. We'll have to do that later. I just can't stand the smell of that old fuel. And for you grass rats out there that know that stink, I'm sure you agree. There might be one of you sick grass rats out there that I actually like the smell of old fuel. That varnishy smell. So Uncle Pat really threw us a really threw us a challenge on this on this turd. That looks like a standard valve cover gasket that they've been making forever. Same with that head gasket. All right. So shit should be able to let me get that valve closed so it'll take some tension off the spring and let's see about popping that valve keeper off do they use the standard valve keeper no this is the kind of valve keeper that's got the pin in it. That's how old this is. This doesn't have that keyed keeper. So I need a little magnet. Can you see in there, Mr. Cameraman? So what I gotta do, it's kinda hard to do with the camera in here and me trying to... There's a pin in there. Can I get it out? I almost got it. It started coming out. Because it won't rise up by prying on it. All right, let me get my valve tool. Hold on. All right, I got my valve, ring, valve spring compressor tool in there. I'm trying to I don't want to lose that that thing looks like it's gonna drop right into the engine block all right I need to turn that valve because there's a hole that goes into the engine block so I need to push that back up Oop. We can grab it out of the top. I don't want to fall in that hole. Did it come out? It's hard to see because I got this camera here. Here we go. I got it. There was a hole in there where the oil returns, and I didn't want that to drop in there. So I was going to turn the valve so that pin would have been facing me. But since the valve was stuck, I would have had to take everything off. But I got lucky. We don't want to lose that pin. So I'm going to put that in my little tray. All right. Now let me turn the engine over. Get that valve open. And now maybe I can wiggle it out of here.
Yeah, that thing is really stuck. I remember one time I had a stuck valve on one of them Chinese generators and it was stuck in there so bad I tried everything. I sprayed everything I had at it to try to get it out and it wouldn't have it wouldn't come out and nothing would dissolve what was on there somebody had poured some kind of oil in it that wasn't an engine oil and uh, that valve would not come out for nothing so finally I sprayed that purple power on there that degreaser cleaner and that whatever it was it just started melting away and I'm like, wow, that cleaner degreaser dissolved that stuff. I put kerosene on it, carb spray, acetone, you name it. Anything I had in here, I was spraying on that valve trying to get it out. And just for the heck of it. And that stuff was all in the crankcase and everything. So I even filled the crankcase with that purple power. I got it all cleaned out, got it back together, got it running, but boy, it smoked like a freight train. It was ruined. Well, just gonna have to keep working at it. Sometimes you just, we gotta do, you just gotta be patient. If you got no patience, you better find another hobby. Yeah, now it's really stuck. Oh man. Why is this thing stuck in there so bad? All right, it took quite a bit, but I got it out. And look, it's dry and crusty. It's a crusty one, not a musty one. There we go. That worked. You should have tried PB Blaster, Caroline. I have PB Blaster. Yeah, I got that PB Blaster crap. I got all that stuff. I grab whatever's on the bench. You know where this is going? Same place Nikki Six goes. Right in the scrap barrel. Junk, junk, junk. Plums in the scrap. I got the valves resurfaced. So now I'm gonna check 
the end gaps on them or the valve clearance should be six and ten. Ten on the exhaust, six on the intake. So now that we had ground some material off the face, it's going to bring it closer, so we may have closed up that gap. So you want the piston at top dead center and both valves closed. So there's open and close, top dead center. So that way we know there's no drag from the camshaft lobe on the valves. So the exhaust is down here and we have more than 10 thousands. It's just a little bit, probably 11 and that's okay. So we're gonna leave that one alone. Now we'll go to the intake and there's no clearance on the intake. So now I gotta grind off a little bit off the stem. And we'll do that again on my valve grinding machine, but chances are you don't have one, so you would do it on a, on a grinding wheel. So say this is the grinding wheel, you just stick it on the end of the grinding wheel and then spin it as you grind a little off and then come back over and check it, grind a little more until you get that six thousandths. Another trick is to go like eight thousand or uh, four thousandths. So that way, if you grind a little bit more off, you'll be at that six. So if you go a little bit smaller, just in case you mess up, then you can go to that six. Get it to six, does that make sense? So on this machine here, this grinding wheel on this side is for grinding a little off the end. Turn in this knob. I'm turning in a little bit. Come over here. Throw it back in. And look at that. Got six thousands. I barely took any off, so we were real close. All right. So now I'll put lapping compound on here. Lap them in. Put the springs back on with the little pins. We'll put the head on and uh, put a plug in it and we'll spin it over by hand or spin it over with the crank. Spray a little stuff in the intake there and see if it licks off. And after that, all we got to do is get that carburetor to work. Got a little valve lapping compound on there. Make sure you get it well distributed. You just want to spin it back and forth. I always like to do that. Seems like it redistributes any of that compound. And then you got to make sure you get it all off of there. Otherwise, if there's any lapping compound left on there, it'll just lap that valve to death. And then you want to check and make sure you got a good solid line going all the way around. If not, just lap it a little more. And there's your dinner. So years ago a fan had sent me this Zim valve grinding, reciprocating and progressive valve grinding tool. I don't know why they call it a valve grinder, it's a valve lapper. And I never had a chance to use it until now because my tool, that little suction cup, is missing for this small valve. So this one's got the right tip in there because see those two little dots? That fits in the valve and then you crank the lever and it, it laps the valve. Isn't that neat? And then it breaks. Probably because I don't have this tight enough. There we go. It didn't break. Knucklehead didn't have it.
So it progressively goes in a circle. That's pretty neat. Ha ha ha! So I finally got to use this thing on this old turd. Before I put the valves in to put the springs on, I need to lubricate the stem. And I'm going to use our gel lube, which is an engine assembly lube and general purpose lube that we sell in our online store. This stuff is real sticky, so it'll stick to the metal parts to give it time for the regular engine oil to get there. All right, now we put the springs in, put our little pins back in, put the head on, and it should start. So to reinstall it, I'm using my Briggs valve spring compressor, and I'm using a pair of hemostats to hold good and tight onto that little pin. And then all you do is just stick it in the hole, and I'll release the hemostats. And voila, reinstalled. Okay, I got a new head gasket. The holes line up. Now, since this being a 63 year old head gasket, chances are it's got asbestos in it. So be careful to not make any kind of dust when you're cleaning this gasket material off this head. Don't use a, don't use a tool to, to buff it off of there. You're gonna have to scrape it off and then dispose of it you know, properly. So, I'm gonna scrape all this off and clean it real good. I got the valves reinstalled, and we're gonna put the valve cover back on. Now you gotta notice the valve cover. It's got two little holes here. Those are drain holes. So when oil gets into here, it can drain out and go back into the crankcase. So make sure you put it on the right way. You want the drain holes towards the bottom so they'll drain out. Don't put it on like this, but put it on like this. So I'll get a new gasket to put on there. So I just wanted to go over those couple of things. Now we're reinstalling the head. On a lot of Briggs engines, just about all of them, these flathead ones, you're always going to have three bolts that are a little bit longer than the rest of them. Those three longer bolts always go over the exhaust valve area. And the reason is they want a little bit more threads because this is going to get a lot hotter, hotter than the intake side and that's supposed to keep them from stretching as much. So you're going to have three bolts that are a little bit longer than the rest. These head bolts are to be torqued at 140 inch pounds and then just go in a cross pattern, whatever pattern you choose, and just gradually tighten them till you get to 140 inch pounds. Okay, I got the head on and torque, got the valve cover on. I put the muffkin in there. This is an old school muffkin, half inch cigar muffkin, and it's an old school one because it's got this ridge in the middle. The newer ones are about this diameter of this ridge all the way across, or seam and where this is a little smaller. So I had a bunch of these old school ones, so I put that in there. The threads were buggered up. It's half inch pipe tap. So I had a half inch pipe tap, so I chased out the threads, and now it's in there, all good. So now I'm gonna set it on the floor. We're gonna crank it up. I'm gonna spray some starting fluid in there, and it should run and die on that starting fluid. And then we just have to wait for the uh, gas tank to get clean and for me to run that carburetor through the ultrasonic cleaner. So that's, that's gonna take a few days. All right, I'm gonna turn the knob to crank. And I'm gonna crank this thing up. And I'll 
spray some starting fluid in there. That's that starter clutch making that horrible noise. So I still have to pull the flywheel off so I can add that kill wire. So I'll probably just get rid of that starter clutch and put a brand new one on there. Because that thing is 60 some years old and I'm not probably going to be able to get it to stop squealing like a pig. But it runs! It runs! It lives again! As soon as we get a carburetor and a gas tank on it. Well, I got the carburetor out of the ultrasonic cleaner and it cleaned up pretty nice. Everything works. The throttle, the choke, it's choking now. But one thing you have to remember, the ultrasonic cleaner is only gonna get it so clean. You're still gonna have to do some fine cleaning to it. Especially as bad as this carburetor was. I still had to go through with regular carburetor spray and, and spray through there to help free everything up. And then there was still a lot of debris from that old fuel, a lot of varnish that I had to go in and pick out. So that's why you gotta have a lot of this stuff. You gotta have these dental tools. You gotta have these tip cleaners. Drill bits. Q-tips. Little wire wheel thing. If you got a gun cleaning kit, they have a lot of these wire brushes because I had to take this one here and run it through the center to clean out a lot of that varnish that was in there was stubborn. And I had to soak this thing a couple of times. I had to take it out of the ultrasonic cleaner, spray it, rinse it all off, spray some car spray in it, and then I had to put it back in again. I got the fuel valve all cleaned, and again, I it was so packed in there, I had to go in there with a drill bit. Let me get some of that dust off of there. And the fuel line was plugged, so I had to kind of go in with a drill bit again. as far as I could, get that cleaned out, and then I took some wire and I stuck it in my cordless drill and, that's, and then was rotting it out that way. And that's how that got all twisted because it would jam and it would start to twist it. And then I had to keep spraying through it and eventually I got it, I got it clear. I kind of un unbent some of these uh, bends in there so I could get a straight shot. I stuck this in the ultrasonic cleaner once I got it rotted out. Sprayed a bunch of carb spray through there. So you gotta have a lot of tools, you gotta have a lot of patience. So I started looking up parts for this to see what was available and what I wasn't able to get. And they still make the needle and seat. Briggs breaks and scrap them. Still makes the needle and seat. It's $25. So I was curious to see if Stenz or Rotary made any parts for this. And Rotary makes a replacement needle and seat. And there's a part number, 1431. And it was way, way cheaper than the breaks and scrap them one. Now the bowl gasket for the float bowl is one of these fiber or paper type bowl gaskets and it's no longer available. Carb kits no longer available. The center nozzles no longer available, but I was able to clean it. Oh, and a Scotch-Brite. You need Scotch-Brite pads too when you're working on these carburetors. So all this stuff I was able to soak in the ultrasonic cleaner and then I went back and cleaned it again with the Scotch-Brite. Took the tip cleaners, went through all these, through here, 
through these little holes. Made sure every passage and everything was clean and clear. I did have a float because this float's ruined. It got holes rotted in it. And it's all full of crap in there. I can hear it. So I went up in my new old stock parts and lo and behold, I had a new float, brand new. And I did find, because the valve, the shutoff valve, the little thumb part, thumb screw part was broke off on ours. And I did find a good used valve just like this that I had in stock. So I'll be able to put this back together. And what else? That's about it on the carburetor. Oh, I did look up this float bowl gasket. Not available, like I told you. But my distributor said they had six or seven left in stock, and once they depleted that stock, it was no longer available. It was discontinued. So I'm going to buy those bowl gaskets to keep on hand just in case. They're pricey, too. List price on this bowl gasket, seven bucks. So in the meantime, I'm gonna make a bowl gasket. Now this is a Walbro rubber bowl gasket for like uh, one of those Kroller K-Series carburetors, the old K-Series. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay it in there and then I'm going to take my X-Acto knife and I'm going to cut it since it's too big. And I'm going to lay it in there. And then I'm going to cut it again. Right there. Oh, it didn't cut through. Let me try that again. Come on, Mr float bowl gasket because it fits in there good there we go now that I got it marked now I'm going to take some crazy glue or super glue because this is impervious to gasoline and then I'm going to glue it back together. And then when my my new ones come in, I could swap it out. But that's what you may have to do when you get in a bind. All right, I found it worked better when I made this gasket by putting the super glue on there and then sticking it in there. Because when I tried to do it on the bench, I wanted to stick to the bench. And I'm like, why am I doing that? We want it to stick to the carburetor. So there we go. There's our, our homemade float bowl gasket. So here's that cover that goes over here. And there's the model number of this engine. So I was able to look it up and get the part numbers. So all I simply did was I typed in Briggs 61706 parts breakdown. And in the search engine, when I giggle searched it, a bunch of you know options came up and I clicked on one and I found a, a parts manual. I had all the parts number. That's how simple it is to find stuff. You just do a giggle search. So I'm working on the tank. I put the vinegar in there. This was my first attempt at the cleaning the tank. Now that's not rust. That is the varnish that's left over from the gasoline. Those are the deposits. Now that's old gasoline. 
This isn't the ethanol crap that they sell us now. This was regular gasoline. This is old gasoline from back in the day. And when it evaporated, this is what it left behind. Because this gas tank is solid. It didn't rot through like the other ones that I've done in the past. So I put some nuts and bolts in there with the vinegar. Now I've been meaning to do this for a long time and I, I haven't got around to it and I'm going to do it because I'm getting tired of cleaning these tanks this way. I'm going to get me a paint shaker, probably a Harbor Freight paint shaker, and I'm going to be able to clamp these tanks in that paint shaker, turn it on, and I'll be able to clean these tanks and probably half an hour of that thing shaking all that stuff around in there. So that's the reason why I like to stick these in a in a tote like that because in case it does rust through whatever liquid you've got in there is going to be able to get caught in this tray. So there's a little tip for you. So the tank's almost clean. Carburetor's ready to go back together. I'm going to put the new starter clutch on, like I said before. So notice how this shaft sticks through the starter clutch. So on a new starter clutch, when I go to put it on there, it's going to push that cap off the end. So I'm going to have to whack off a little bit of the end of the crankshaft when I go to put the new starter clutch on there. On oh, another thing, these little rubber pieces here, they still make them. Brakes and Scrapple still makes them. And Rotary has them, but you gotta buy 10 at a time. So there's the part numbers, the OEM Brakes and Scrapple ones. And there they are. There's the Rotary part number. So if you're a rotary dealer, you have to buy 10 at a time. But these fit a lot of their engines, the five horse Briggs, a lot of different. So I can replace these. These are nice and soft. And then this is the other one that goes on the carburetor. Just in case you're restoring one of these old mowers and you want to find this stuff, there's the other one that goes on there. So there's one other thing I want to go over, and that's this wheel height adjustment. I, I lubed up the cable, so that's working again. And I went and I sprayed lubricant on this. So this works good now. So now look how easy it goes up and down. So let's take a look at this, how, this, how that works. So they got some little gears down here. And there's a heavy spring on it because now that I don't have it on its wheels, this thing really wants to spring back and forth. So there's little gears, here's a little mechanism back here. And they got this shaft running through here. And there's another gear in the front. And this is an 18 inch mower. I don't know if I mentioned that. The cutting width is 18 inches. Blade's not too bad, I can throw an edge on there. This looks like a universal blade anyway because they probably couldn't get the OEM blade. And I did notice that there is a hole rotted through here. Now, if I was to restore this mower, I could fix that hole with our tarot putty. Because I did it on that mop mower. So for those grass rats that remember the restoration of that mop mower, there was a whole section of that deck that was missing 
And I was able to fix it with that tarot putty. So I, I would be able to do the same here. Now this mower isn't mine, it's Uncle Pat's. So once we get it running and it goes back to him, if he wants to restore it, that's up to him. I'm not going to restore it. We're just going to get it running. And sometimes people like to have that patina on there. Here's another little option for the handle. You can reach down with your foot, kick that up, and now the handle locks out of the way. Now you can adjust the wheel height, which is kind of neat. I like that option. This is a pretty nice little push mower. So all right, let's uh, get that carburetor back together, get that fuel tank grained out and uh, cleaned up and sealed. And what I would seal it with would be red coat. So for those of you brass rats that want a good tank sealer that's easy to use, get this red coat fuel tank liner. It's real easy to use. You just rinse it out with uh, acetone and then uh, you pour this stuff in there. You swish it around till it coats the whole inside of the tank and you dump out the excess. And within uh, like two days you can put gas back in it. So if you're into restoring old equipment, you might want to look into getting some red coat. All right, so I have me a, a regular brakes and scrap them kill wire that I had left over from something, just a solid wire. And that wire has to go in with this coil wire to the condenser. And then I'll route it through here, and then when I put the cover back on, that's going to be our kill wire. So that's how that works. So I'll pull that spring back, I'll take the condenser back off, collapse that spring and shove this wire in there and I have to reset the points. And then to determine how much I needed to cut off of here, what I did was I got the new starter clutch and like I was saying, it's got this cap on there where the old one doesn't have the cap. So as soon as I put this on, when I go to tighten it down, it's going to pop that cap off and it's going to push that little wick that's inside there out. That little wick is what keeps this shaft lubricated. But it's too tall because they changed the design of it. So to determine how much I needed to cut off, I took my scale put my scale in there and that's going to be right up against that wick that's in there and it's at about two and a sixteenth inches so I want to put it at two inches because I want to give it a little bit of space in there I don't want it to be right up against it and then with the flywheel on and the washer I marked it at two inches and then I took a tubing cutter and put a tubing cutter on there and just spun the tubing cutter around so that way I got a nice even line all the way around it. So now you can either take a hacksaw or a wizard wheel and you can cut that off. So if you're restoring a mower it's got the old starter clutch and she's squealing like a pig and you want to put the new one on there you could either just jam the new one on and let it pop that cap off and keep it the way it was original with no cap or you can upgrade it to the new one and cut that off all right so instead of uh resetting the points since i already set them all i did was take the uh points off Took that little plastic tool, collapsed the spring, shoved the kill wire in there. Now all I got to do is put the points back on. There we go. Now they're all set again like they were.
Now we're good to go. Now I can put the cover back on, tuck the wire in that groove. Now they put some silicone on there because they want to keep dirt and stuff out of there. So I'll put a, put a little booger snot of some silicone on there and then I'll put the cover back on. That way we can make sure that no dirt, dust, anything gets into this cover. Put the flywheel on, I'll have that cut off. Let's get this baby running again. There's your dinner. I'll grind a little radius on the top. Set this baby up all the way. I'll trim that wire off. Oh, gotta put the key in. I'll trim that wire off once I put the carburetor back on. There's your dinner. Now I gotta put the screen on. I'll put the carpet tray around before I put the blower shroud back on. Okay, I got the carburetor back on. I had to tweak this tab for the kill switch. I got the cable hooked up. So what I did is I loosened the screw and shoved the wire behind this square nut and then tighten it down. And then I made sure that when I go all the way to choke, I'm getting full choke here, because this is the choke lever. And then when I go to stop, this is hitting the stop tab. So that's all set now. So, finish cleaning out the tank and uh, hook the tank up, put the plug wire back on, put some dinosaur juice in it, top off the dinosaur syrup. I'll get it nice and hot once I get it running and get the carburetor adjusted, suck all that nasty oil out of there when it's all hot and then I'll refill it with some fresh dinosaur syrup. All right. Put dinosaur juice in it. It's been sitting in there a few minutes. Carburetor ain't leaking. And I don't know if I mentioned how this crank works. But when you turn it to crank, a little pin comes out and gets in between the uh, fins of the flywheel. That's what holds it. Because watch, when I got it on start, as I start to crank it, it's, it's spinning the mower. It's spinning the crankshaft over. So when you put it to crank, that little pin comes out, goes in between the fins of the flywheel, which holds the flywheel, and then when you turn it, of course it sucks it in and then it lets, the, lets that wound up spring spin it away. Put it on choke and see how many times it's going to take to crank this thing over to get it to start. There's one.
There's two. Come on, baby. I got the screws at about one and a half and one. One and a half on the high and one on the low. This one's the high speed. I can smell gas, so it should be licking off here. I'm getting full choke. Gotta give it a little help. Maybe I flooded it. Alright, we got no spark. And the reason we got no spark is this screw for this kill wire is touching the cover. And it's grounding out. So that screw is just a little bit too long. So I'm going to take that screw out, probably because of this plastic is all distorted. So I'm going to take that screw out and grind some of the threads off the end of it and put it back in. That's why she won't start, see? Little things like that. Instead of tearing it, tearing it all apart. I checked for spark, it didn't have any spark and I thought it's got to be this. Just a little bit too long. Like I said, this is all distorted and squished. So that was probably holding it off more. So I'll just grind a little bit off the end. Got spark now. Just had to grind that in there. So I figured it had to be something we did because I did have it running. So I shouldn't have to choke it. It might just start. fine-tune the carburetor a little bit. So I must have done a decent job rebuilding that carburetor. Take the choke off.
clean around. The air, the oil bath. So you're just filling up to that ridge. Fill it up to there. These would come in a repair shop. If you had to flip this thing up, first thing you'd have to do is take the air cleaner off. She lives again. 10 degrees outside right now. Well, we polished another turd. We got this going for Uncle Pat. Now Uncle Pat can do all the restoration to it if he desires, but at least it runs. Or he may want to keep that original patina. And then, I don't know if you noticed, but when I first started it got it running, it did that little dust and diamond in the beginning. Did you hear that? Screech. From Saved by the Bell, <laughs> Dustin Diamond. So it did that little screech until it got that oil from that wick on there and then it went away immediately. So that helped. And then there's one other thing I need to do to this before we give it back to Pat. And that's put a brakes and scrap them sticker on it. Yeah, which we sell in our online store need to get yourself one and look that fits perfect right there like it was made for it now when I was upstairs in the parts room that used to be my house looking for parts for that carburetor I ran across this maybe some of you grass rats remember the oil minder I found a brand new old stock oil minder. What's an oil minder, Terrell? What's that? What do you got in that box? What's an oil minder? Hold on, hold on, I'm getting it out. I'll show you what it is. Impatient grass rats. I can't even get it out. Now I'm getting frustrated and I don't want to rip the box. This was a, a little gimmick that Brakes and scrap them had back in the day. You would take this oil cap off and on this push mower, you would screw this in there. And then if you wanted to check your oil, you just push that button and then it would, like a suction cup, it would pull oil up into there. And that's how you knew if the oil was full or not. It's the lazy man's oil checker. Instead of taking the cap off and looking, you could just walk up and push the button. This little extension was probably for the horizontal shaft engines so it could get down in there. But I found this up there and I thought, oh, they might want to see this. This thing's pretty old. And the rubber isn't all dry rotted. So I don't want to stick it on there because I want to keep it pristine in its original pristine condition. Well, we got a decent day, so let's cut with this thing.
actually, this is a nice little mower. It cuts good, had plenty of power. Yeah, this would be a nice vintage mower to have to actually cut your grass with. I like it. I like the way it looks and everything. It's pretty cool. So, like I said earlier, polished another turd, 1960 Dylan McGuire lawnmower made in Richmond, Indiana. And we polished the stink out of this turd. Heard it missing a little bit. That might be that old coil breaking up because we did a valve job, did the carburetor. It's got hot spark, but that little miss might be an ignition miss from that old coil. But it runs and it will cut. It'll cut you like a knife. So subscribe to this YouTube channel, Terrell Fixes All. I'm Terrell. Follow me with your antique push mowers on Facebook and Instagram. Go to our web store. Check out all the stuff we got there, like that Breaks and Scrap em sticker. We got all kinds of stickers. This beautiful shirt I'm wearing, this spark plug necklace. You'll be the talk of the town. They'll be like, look at that weirdo. What the heck is he wearing? And as always, there's your dinner. Woo! Turn polishing one-on-one! 1960 push mower! All right, Pat, come and get it. Come and get your dinner. <laughs>
I'll come out wherever you are. Don't hurt me! Ed, what are you doing up here? Don't hurt me! He's drunk. Arrest this man. It's true. I'm hammered. Action. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't deal with that. That's for the real police. Yep. 